more than 300 climbers have died on Mount Everest. The vast majority of those who die on the mountain are eventually found, but are left behind because it is too difficult to get them down the steep slopes. Some serve as somber markers along the treacherous path, while others are uncovered years later when the elements shift and reveal their tragic presence. But there are still a few climbers who have never been found, who have disappeared without a trace. This is the eerie story of one of those climbers, one who's been missing on the mountain for almost 50 years. As so many times before, this story of mountaineers on the highest mountain on earth begins with hubris. For the history of Everest did not end with its conquest via the South Coal by Hillary and Tenzing in 1953. Quite the contrary. That is when it really began. Because once a mountain is ascended, all the endless ways in which it can be climbed still remains. Without oxygen, fastest climbing time, most ascents, via the north face, via the east face, and so on. In 1975, when this story takes place, climbing the mountain via its southwest face is considered the ultimate challenge or Everest the hard way, as the leader of the 1975 British expedition Chris Bonington called the book he wrote after returning to England. From 1970 to 1975, no less than five expeditions, two of them Japanese, had attempted the southwest face. What all five had in common was that they had all stopped in front of the so-called rock band, a protruding and steeply sloping rock wall that forms the last obstacle before the south summit, from where the path to the actual summit is largely free. To do what five previous expeditions had failed to do, experienced climber and expedition leader Chris Bonington gathered the cream of the British mountaineering elite for the task. For the ascent, he wanted to take the same route as the Japanese climbers in 1970. The plan was to establish Camp 6 on the upper snowfield and then make a long traverse to the southeast ridge. The team would also use extra oxygen above Camp 4 and 13,000 feet of fixed rope up the mountain wall. However, Bonington was far too experienced to imagine that a carefully planned route and a team of skilled climbers would be enough to succeed. No. Conquering the southwest face before the onset of winter required a veritable siege of the mountain. With an army of porters to carry the 24 tons of equipment and 12 tons of food required to sustain the 14 capable climbers he had recruited, he wanted to ensure that he always had rested climbers that could move up the mountain at the necessary speed. It was not for nothing that the expedition was called the apotheosis of the great military expeditions. The team flew from London to Kathmandu. There they split into two groups and trekked separately, reaching Kunde on August 14th after a two-week trek. They met the Lama in Thiangboche to get his blessing. Hundreds of porters then carried all the equipment and food from Kunde to the base camp, where they arrived on August 23rd. It was during this period that the expedition suffered its first setback, when one of the porters, a deaf-mute boy, disappeared between the base camp and Kunde, and was later found dead in a stream. From base camp, the climbers secured a route through the dreaded icefall, perhaps the most dangerous part of the climb, with its shifting cracks and falling ice blocks and reached the top of the icefall on August 26th, where they also found a suitable site for Camp 1, a place where surrounding cracks would swallow any avalanches. From Camp 1, it took three days to find a route to a suitable location for Camp 2, at the top of the Western Coombe. One week was spent establishing Camp 2, and on September 6th, they climbed 1,200 feet up the southwest side to the site chosen for Camp 3. The next day, they climbed beyond Camp 3, and took two days to fix ropes over heavy powder snow. After two more days, they were able to establish Camp 4 at 23,700 feet and fix ropes beyond it towards the Great Central Gully. Here, one of the climbers was hit by an avalanche, and although he was not directly injured, ice crystals filled his lungs, and he had to be helped down the mountain wall. On September 18th, eight Sherpas arrived at Camp 4 to carry more equipment up to the site selected for Camp 5, and the next day the reconnaissance up the gorge by the rock band began. On the same day, Bonington announces his long-awaited decision on who will make the first summit attempt. The names heard over the radio from Camp 5 are no surprise to anyone. Even within the cream of the crop there is a hierarchy, and in 1975 there is no doubt 
that those at the top of the British climbing elite are Doug Scott and Dougal Haston. Since Haston is currently at Camp 2, it is at the same time clear that Nick Estcourt and Paul Braithwaite will be given the most difficult and dangerous mission of all, to get past the rock band. In the early morning of September 20th, Estcourt and Braithwaite leave Camp 5 to take turns climbing the rock band. They climb at 23,600 feet, weighed down by oxygen cylinders, towards the left-hand gully with very few places to take pitons, but eventually they reach a patch of snow, suitable for a dead man's anchor. Here the gorge proper begins, and the risk of avalanches increases. After a few trail changes, Braithwaite sees a ramp on the right, but as he walks towards it, he runs out of oxygen and almost faints. A fall would kill him. After taking off his mask, he reaches a place where he can drive his ice axe deep into the snow. Estcourt takes him out in the lead, and continues up the ramp to a relatively safe position, where he also runs out of oxygen. He continues where there is very little grip, and where the only piton is not stable at all. Finally, he reaches a crack that can be used for a fixed piton. This is probably the most difficult climb ever done, at this altitude. Estcourt later described the climb as Scottish Grade 3, although this did not take into account the difficulty of a 27,000-foot climb. With this feat, a rock band has been climbed in a single day. On September 23rd, Haston and Scott set out at 3.30 in the morning to attempt the summit. In six and a half hours, they cross the upper snowfield and then spend another five hours attaching ropes and making their way up the couloir to the south summit. When they reach the south summit at 3 p.m., the southeast ridge, Hillary and Tenzing's original route to the summit, lies before them. To the left, the southwest side plunges steeply, to the right. Curving corniches of ice show the way to China. Soon, the Hillary Step appears in front of them. It is the 40 feet high and 70 degree steep stone wall that must be conquered before the summit of Everest can be reached. On the right side it drops 10,000 feet, and on the left side 8,000 feet. Haston leads the way up the Hillary Step, and the pair reaches the summit together as the sun begins to set at 6 p.m. on September 24th, 1975. The view is magnificent. Brown plains and mountains, most resembling small hills, and thin silver strands of mighty rivers cut through the landscape. In the increasing darkness, they start to descend. By the time they get back to the south summit, the light has almost completely disappeared under a fast-moving sky, so they prepare for a bivouac. They dig out a pit, and spend a cold night. Scott later estimated the temperature to minus 50 degrees Celsius. They constantly rub each other to try to ward off the cold and stay awake, knowing that they will die if they fall asleep. When it gets light, they continue downhill and reach Camp 6 at 9 o'clock and announce their news by radio. They have survived without getting frostbite. After Haston and Scott came back from the summit in one piece, the entire expedition was considered a success story from start to finish. From Chris Bonington's years of meticulous planning to the firm anchoring of the tents with aluminum tubes on the steep slopes. Still, Bonington held off on the big celebration. The fact remained that he had assembled a considerable number of climbers who were not going to be satisfied with the mere success of the expedition, but were now all lining up to do what they had really come to do. Climb the world's highest mountain. Even though he himself would have been more than happy to pack up and go home, he knew he couldn't leave until everyone had had a chance to get to the top. Bonington was probably right to wait to savor too much of the sweetness of victory. Perhaps he should also have taken the very strange experience that Nick Estcourt had the morning after Haston and Scott returned from the summit, as the omen he would later describe it as, and call off the entire expedition. The event takes place at 4 o'clock in the morning of September 26th, as Nick Escort moves slowly along a fixed rope on his way from Camp 4 up to 5, with a bottle of oxygen to give to the group about to make the second summit ascent. After defeating the rock band, he and Paul Braithwaite are ungratefully at the back of the queue for the summit. While they rest after their tremendous feat of securing fixed ropes over the rock band and wait for the third summit group's turn, Nick has been tasked with moving an oxygen tube from Camp 4 to Camp 5. The moon is bright, and the rocks are etched black in sharp contrast to the white snow. 
when he is about 60 meters above Camp 4, something very strange happens. Without knowing why, he turns his eyes back to Camp 4. He later said that it might have been because he felt that someone was following him. And sure enough, further down the slope he immediately sees a figure next to the same rope that he is attached to. The figure, which looks like an ordinary climber, is close enough for Nick to see his arms and legs, but too far away to feel his movements on the rope. Wondering who could have decided to follow him, he decides to wait for his companion. As soon as he stops, the figure begins to move very slowly, without making any effort to shout or wave. Nick calls down to the climber himself, but since he doesn't get an answer, he decides to ignore it and keep moving forward. As he continues climbing upwards, he turns around three or four times and can still see the climber behind him. When he finally reaches an old camp of a previous expedition and turns around, the figure is gone. In retrospect, Nick describes it as unpleasant because he didn't know if the climber had fallen, not least because there was no way the climber in that time could have made it back down to Camp 4. When he arrives at Camp 5 at about 6 o'clock in the morning, he immediately tells about the mysterious figure that he had seen following him. When Paul Braithwaite and the rest of the Sherpas, who were in Camp 4 when he left that morning, arrive at Camp 5 later in the day, he asks them if anyone left the camp almost immediately after he did. They reply that no one left before 8 a.m., so he can conclude that it is impossible for the figure to belong to their expedition. No other expedition is on the southwest face of Everest at that time either. Bonington later says in his book that Nick's experience could have been a hallucination due to the thin air. However, he also writes that Nick was well acclimatized to the altitude and that he had the analytical mind of a mathematician. It may have been a supernatural phenomenon, perhaps an omen of what would happen on the mountain later that day. Further up the mountain in Camp 6, the climbers of the second summit attempt are getting ready to start their attack. Pete Boardman, 25 years old and the youngest member of the expedition, who proved his mettle three years earlier with rapid alpine-style ascents of two mountains in the Hindu Kush range. He straps on his crampons and adjusts his oxygen mask. It's just after four in the morning, but although there's no wind, a thin layer of fog covers the western horizon, and a tidal wave of clouds quickly washes up from the western coom and creeps onto the face itself. Before he can grab the ropes that Doug and Dougal have strung across the snowfield above the rock band, the ever-impatient Martin Boyson has beaten him to it. Martin is two years older than Peter, and with his silky smooth climbing technique, he had made a name for himself as a future climbing star at a very young age. Behind Pete joins Pertemba, who at just 26 years old has impressed Bonington with his manner and personality, to such an extent that he has made him the main Sherpa of the expedition. Behind Pertemba, is Mick Burke, who also carries a camera and camera equipment. The 33-year-old Burke, who was one of the first to be asked to join the expedition, is a highly experienced climber who also obtained a permanent position as a cameraman with the BBC. When Burke was asked by Bonington if he wanted to go as a fully participating climber or as a cameraman, he had answered, both. For the first two hours, the climbers become increasingly separated along the rope. Pete keeps a steady pace, but notices that he is starting to catch up with Martin Boyson in front. He hears Martin muttering angrily, before ripping off his oxygen mask in despair that the unit seems to have given up. To make matters worse, he has also dropped a crampon, and he disconnects himself from the rope so Peter can pass him. Martin will not make it to the top this day. Pete takes the lead and continues with Pertemba and Mick Burke behind him. When Pete and Pertemba reach the small gully just before the south summit, they turn around and see a black dot in the distance. The distance is so far that they can conclude that Mick has also decided to stop. Despite Mick being considered one of the best climbers on the expedition, Bonington had been reluctant to let him join the second group to reach the summit. By the time Pete and Martin had made it to Camp 5 the morning before, Mick had fallen well behind. By the time they had reached Camp 6, later the same day Mick had again fallen behind. Since they had also failed to bring enough oxygen for four people to reach the summit, Pete and Martin had suggested to Bonington that he should allow Mick to forego the summit attempt. The suggestion had come as no surprise to Bonington, who was already worried about Mick, who had been in and above Camp 5 for eight nights. He couldn't help but agree, 
and replied that under no circumstances should Mick go to the summit. He asked Pete and Martin to tell Mick to call him when he reached Camp 6. A short time later Mick reached camp and Martin, who went out to meet him and pick up his pack, was impressed by how heavy it was with all the camera equipment. Mick was his usual animated self and explained that he had repaired some of the fixed ropes below, something Bonington had asked him to do. He had then passed the high-altitude porter, only to find that his oxygen supply had failed. Mick had stopped him from going back to wait for another porter to return from Camp 6, and then they had swapped equipment. All this had taken time. When Pete and Martin were confronted with Mick's explanation, the decision to leave him behind seemed no longer tenable, especially since they had later discovered two more oxygen bottles buried in the snow at Camp 6. When Martin said that Chris wanted to talk to him on the radio to tell him to come back down, Mick commented, Chris can go to hell. Bonington later told that when he heard Mick's voice on the radio, he sounded cautious, possibly aggressive. He explained to Mick that he was concerned about his slowness and the fact that he had been up on the mountain for so long. Mick responded by giving Bonington the same explanation as to why it had taken him so long. Since there was no point in having a confrontation over the radio, Bonington asked Mick to put him through to Martin. Bonington then told Martin that it was up to them to decide if they wanted to take Mick on the summit attempt. Martin, obviously embarrassed and worried, said that Mick seemed strong enough and that they didn't see how they could leave him out. By the time Pete and Pertemba have established that Mick too has abandoned his summit attempt after all, the clouds have crept up the mountain wall and enveloped them in a thin fog. The wind is increasing steadily, but the visibility is still quite good. As Pertemba comes over the crest of the South Peak, he alerts Pete that he has a problem with his oxygen, and they spend a full hour clearing two inches of ice blocking the airflow. Despite this, they still make excellent time. They swap their oxygen bottles and continue to the top. Pete takes a step out onto the southeast ridge. For a second, he stands on a crust, but shortly afterwards he falls through and the snow reaches his kneecaps. With renewed effort, he takes another step, and then another. Pertemba follows close behind. Since they are climbing immediately after the monsoon season, and with so much drifting snow, they have to be very careful. It is difficult to tell what is on the rock itself and what is hanging off the edge. Unlike all the photographs they have seen, the Hillary step is not a cliff step on this day, but just a break in the continuity of snow cover. But although the snow makes the slope much flatter, the snow has the consistency of sugar. They sink down to their knees and have to fight hard with their crampons and ice axes to get across. Pete is the first to get over the crest to stand upright on the rock. In front of him, a wide whale's back now runs the last 300 meters to the top. Once Pertemba has also reached the top, he takes the lead and climbs the final slope towards the summit and the red flag someone has left behind. The snow gets better, and he slows down to let Pete come alongside. They walk together side by side up the last few steps to the top and emerge together. The whole world is now below them. They are on top of everything. It's ten past one, and even though they have been at it for nine hours, they realize that it is a very fast time. However, they are not rewarded with the magnificent view that Scott and Haston had told them about. Now, two days later, the summit is shrouded in a fine wind-driven fog, and the red flag is the only sign that they are standing on the highest point on Earth. They take photographs of each other and Pete speaks to the world on a miniature tape recorder. Hey, here's the first bit of recorded audio from the top of Mount Everest. Would you like to say a word to the viewers, Pertemba? A muffled sound follows, due to the fact that Pertemba is still enclosed in his oxygen mask. In this completely relaxed atmosphere, they eat some chocolate and mint cake, and then head down. They still have plenty of time. It is almost twenty to two in the afternoon. They haven't gone more than three hundred feet, when to their great surprise, they see a figure through the fog. It is Mick Burke sitting on a slight slope from the summit. At the sight of Pete and Pertemba, he stands up and congratulates them. He asks if he can film them on some bump on the ridge, pretending it's the top, but Pete tells him about the red flag, and he asks if they want to go back to the top with him. Pete reluctantly says yes, but Mick seems to sense this reluctance and changes his mind, saying that he will just go up and film the peak and then come straight back down to them.
As Pete and Pertemba start walking back, Mick films them, and Pete takes some still shots of him. Mick tells them to wait for him, at the cliff next to the south summit. Almost immediately after they leave Mick, a strong wind starts to blow. It pushes snow over their heads and visibility becomes almost non-existent. They make their way down to the cliff next to the south summit, and wait. The wind howls around the cliff and the snow increases. Time slows down. Pete doesn't know how often he finds his wristwatch under the layers of clothing, but each time the hands have barely moved at all. Their anxiety grows as they realize they need to make a decision whether to keep waiting or try to get down themselves. At four o'clock in the afternoon, Pete throws his icy glasses out into the whiteness and tries to remove the ice from his eyelashes with his mittens. He bends his head down in the breeze and tries to peer along the ridge towards the top. Mick should have met them at least 45 minutes ago, and now they have waited at least an hour and a half. He curls up with Pertemba next to the rock, and Pertemba says he can't feel his fingers or toes. Pete thinks of Mick in his foggy glasses, blinded by snow smoke, and the short length of fixed rope on the Hillary step. He thinks of their own retreat, and that it took Doug and Dougal three hours to reach Camp 6 from their bivouac and that they themselves have only an hour of light left. A decision is needed. Pete looks at his watch and says, Let's wait ten more minutes. Pertemba agrees. It helps their anxiety to shift some responsibility to the watch. Soon after, time is up and they start walking. At first they go the wrong way, 200 feet too far towards South Coal before finding the right path and making it past the South Summit. The wind dies down for a short while, and Pete looks up towards the summit. There is still no sign of Mick, and it is now about half past four. The decision has been made, and they have to fight for their own lives. The early afternoon is turning into night, and success is turning into tragedy. They start to move faster, but where are they? Pete feels the panic rise inside of him, but then sees two rocks he recognizes from the morning. They continue on their way, and then see Doug's oxygen bottle marking the top of the fixed rope. From there, they start crossing the upper snowfield, and at half past seven they stumble into Camp Six. When Pete sees Martin Boysen, he bursts into tears. Pete and Pertemba crawl into their sleeping bags, and Pete describes the latter as the worst night of his life. The storm, the lack of oxygen, and the thought of Mick still out there. Big, strong, cocky Mick, who has made so many successful ascents. No one can believe that he is gone. He will surely arrive in an hour or so, at worst, he will spend the night in a bivouac and arrive the next morning. But as the hours fly by and the storm grows stronger, hope begins to fade. Slowly they have to accept that which will become an undeniable fact. Mick will never come back from the top. The storm continues through September 27th. Any more summit attempts, or even rescue attempts of Mick, are out of the question. When the time finally comes for Pete, Pertemba, and Martin to descend to Camp 5, Pete described it as pure anxiety based on the fact that he felt completely disconnected from them further down the mountain. That he had an experience he could not share with them. On September 28th, the storm had passed, and the third top team was still in Camp 5. But because avalanches were coming down the slope, and there was no hope of finding Mick. The expedition was abandoned. The 1975 British Everest expedition would be considered by most to be a great success. In particular, it had achieved the impossible, climbing the mountain via the southwest face. But the mountain had also claimed its victims. The first had occurred on August 25th, having first reached the base camp two days earlier. A deaf-mute boy called Mingma who had been sent from the small village of Gorak Shep to carry things up to base camp had never arrived. At first, the other Sherpas hadn't been too worried. They figured he'd just got lost and spent the night in the open, only to arrive the next day. But when he didn't show up the next day either, the concern became palpable. As a deaf mute, he could be stuck somewhere with no way to call for help, completely dependent on being found. Being extra vulnerable, he had also developed a special relationship with the members of the expedition. Doug Scott, in particular, had taken him under his wing and often sent him on extra missions to let him earn extra money. A search was arranged by Chris Bonington. He sent out six teams to search, 
It was also Doug's team that first spotted clothes near a small river. Soon after, they saw someone lying in the water. Doug ran over and lifted the boy, who had the same gentle expression as always. Doug cried uncontrollably for the boy. Someone consoled Doug that at least he had brightened the little boy's life, which otherwise would have been poor and without prospects. In the light of the conditions under which the Sherpas lived, what had happened was probably inevitable. This inevitability is a recurring theme for those who study Mount Everest and its many expeditions. Two people died during the 1975 British expedition. On the surface, two completely different people, the strong, successful climber and cameraman and the vulnerable little deaf-mute boy. But in the light of what happened next, were their circumstances really so different? When Mick Burke was asked by Chris Bonington to go to Everest, he had replied, I don't think Everest offers much choice. If you've been to Everest once and didn't get to the top, you'll want to go again if the opportunity arises. Even if you don't really want to, you have no choice. Imagine how it would feel if someone made it to the top that time and you weren't involved. It's really no more difficult than that. The same goes for his decision to continue alone to the top. All the climbers on the expedition said they would have done exactly what Mick did if they were in his situation. It wasn't many feet to the summit. It was relatively early in the day. Turning back when so close was simply not an option. Both the deaf mute boy and Burke did what anyone else would have done. Everest gave them no choice. And while climbing Everest is not what it once was in the golden years of this expedition, the mountain still exerts its magnetic pull while steadily claiming its victims. The stakes are still high and Everest demands its sacrifice because the mountain always wins, like a casino. This is the last photo of Mick Burke before he stepped into eternity and added his name to the long list of names that make up the dead on Everest. It is taken by Pete just before he is about to walk alone to the top. No one knows if he ever reached the summit. Most people take it as likely, but what would ultimately be his death? No one knows. The fact that his body has never been found suggests that he accidentally stepped over some edge in the white snow to fall tens of thousands of feet. The only thing we can be sure of is that he is still lying there somewhere. Thank you for watching this episode. If you liked it, it would mean a lot to us if you give it a like and a comment. It helps out a lot.